correct. That's correct. That's correct. Let's begin with phase one. A little tip for the working man. Your employers are all our friends. That's the story from the editorial board. That's the story from the editorial board. Correct. I just biked around Lake Michigan. We will shut you down. We will cite you. And if we need to, we will arrest you and we will take you to jail. Nearly a thousand miles. That's the story from the well, I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. That's correct. Hey guys, how's it going? We're live. Hey, today on the show, a brand new song from Michael Girardi, the man you just heard right there. You've heard the editorial board. You've heard Bailout. His and new single, Tax Increment Financing, <laughs> will be debuting today on the Ben Jarofsky All Show. All right. right? I was going to play it now, but I figure let's wait for more people to get on the live stream so then more people can hear it. That's the story of the editory. Oh, bow, wow, wow. <laughs> Can't wait, man. Finally, a song about Tiffs. He's been waiting uh, for about 30 years now, guys. <laughs> Finally, a song for him. Come on and join my Tiff Convoy. Hey, ain't it a beautiful set? Live stream chat. What's happening? Weigh in. We need a song of the day for Ben to sing to get us going here. Um, we'll be announcing this probably throughout the week. Uh, we're taking next week off. Woo! Uh, yeah. And then we're going to try and transition back into the sun times. Whoa, gosh. It turns out it's uh, <laughs> like a sauna in this attic. <laughs> it's, uh, it was 97 degrees yesterday in the attic, yeah, ladies so, and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to be doing the show a little later on. You may hear the air conditioner kick in, all right? Live stream chat, we need your help. If you hear that air conditioner and go, boy, that just, can you shut that off, please? Uh, it's really distracting. Let us know, and then we'll shut it, can't it off. can't be worse than the train. Well, I mean... <laughs> It can't be worse than the guy going into the porta potty. That's just not a, a philosophy I want to roll with moving forward in my job. Uh, well, it can't be worse than this. Uh, we should be back in fall goes well in two weeks, huh, Dave? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're going to take the week off next week. Uh, and like I said, let us know uh, if you hear that air conditioner and if it's driving you crazy. Let us know. We don't know until, uh, you know, you say something. So we'll do that. All right. Everybody weighing in on the live stream chat here. Brianna, what's happening? Jeff, what's going on? Uh, your Ben Jarofsky show for Tuesday, May 26th is just moments away. But before we do this, let's thank the following unions for sponsoring this program. Unions like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, are sponsors, as well as the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thanks, unions. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by our dear friends at the Chicago Federation of labor. All right. I'm going to look at the live stream chat and we'll get you a song of the day to sing. Okay, buddy. 
Okay. All right. I got a song. If no one has one, I could sing any old song. You know that, don't okay. you? Yeah, yeah. All right. Here we go. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kyle, I don't think he knows uh, Tony, Tony, Tone. Uh, Tony? Yeah, man. Oh, you do? Raphael Sadiq. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Can you sing us a song by Tony, Tony, Tone? Perhaps It Feels Good? Uh, No. Okay. I just know that Raphael Sadiq. How it. about this? I actually saw Tony Tone, uh, <laughs> but Raphael Sadiq wasn't there that night. He was like, hey, I'm not bothering with. For 10 trivia points, D, what TV show does Raphael Sadiq write the music to? Oz. What is it called? Oz? No, I can't oh. remember the name of it, actually. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, your song of the day uh, okay. is <laughs> Vacation by the Go Go's. Um,. Oh, yeah, everybody knows that song. I'm going on vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Brianna. <laughs> the Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. <laughs> It is Tuesday, May 26th. Yes, that's the Brown Line. And live from Ben's house, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, Senator Rob Martwick. And now your host, not a senator, Chicago Reader columnist, Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Daddy Darren Tuesday. And here's why. Great weekend. Do you have a good weekend, D? It was decent. Whoa. That's that. Wow. It was okay. Man, that's a big improvement over last weekend, which well, I think the quote was, <laughs> no, it sucked. But wow, good for you, man. Yeah. I know you were, did a lot of bike riding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smoked a lot of reefer. Good yeah, weekend. Yeah, yeah. Just kidding. He didn't. No, okay. I did. I did. Okay. All right. There goes the WBEZ <laughs> job. I right, try to win them over, D. Okay. <laughs> anyway, hey, BEZ, it's legal now, all right? Yeah. So that's not even a good excuse anymore. You just don't like him because he's from downstate. Let's just be honest. All right. Sorry. Where was I? Um, try to l watch the last game, which is uh, the sequel to The Last Dance, which is an ESPN special about the, literally the last Bulls game, the one where Jordan hit the shot over Utah. And it turns out, D, that you have to have some special ESPN connection. My little bootleg operation that I picked up, thanks to Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, doesn't work. So instead of watching that, I uh, made like a millennial and watched eight straight episodes of Homecoming. Some serious binge. Watch. Ever heard of Homecoming, D? Yeah, I heard it's really good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Julia Roberts. I love, love Julia Roberts. And uh, eight episodes, though. Man, I was just cruising on that sucker, all right? <laughs> and, and I woke up with a binge-watching uh, hangover and discovered I had been a neglectful host. You hear me, D? Our favorite state rep. The pride and joy of Clay County. One big feller, Darren Bailey, was in town, and I didn't welcome to Chicago, D. I know. God damn, Darren! I just don't. Pat Whoop! Here it comes. Feel it? Oh, feels so good. That <laughs> can you please? The air conditioner just kicked on, guys. Let us know if you can hear that. Ah, oh, God. Let me just take a moment just to enjoy the air conditioner. Ah, oh, so nice. It was ninety-seven degrees in there. I'm writing a column yesterday, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, Darren Bailey, of course, is the downstate Republican uh, who is now the face of the Republican Party. Let's face it, he's probably the most prominent Republican in the state of Illinois. Uh, Dennis said two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, that when DB uh, first made the news, that look out, this guy's running for governor. We'll get to that. Uh, so he was in, uh, he made a name for himself, suing Governor J.B. Pritzker on the grounds that Pritzker had infringed on his, DB's, right to catch and pass COVID-19. All right, man's got a constitutional right, D., to pass a deadly disease, all right? Freedom ain't free. It's got a hefty beep and fee, all right, D? Notice I didn't swear. Thank you. You're Thanks. welcome. That's that job of thinking about. I'm thinking of you, man. Thinking of you, all right? Uh, so anyway, uh, D, uh, Darren Bailey led a protest at Buckingham Fountain on Monday, Memorial Day. There was a bunch of... Uh, you imagine if you mix those letters up, Buckingham Fountain? Whoa. <laughs> Hadn't thought about that, but almost did it, D. Now it's in my head. Man, thinks it's funny. Now let's let's make fun of the guy with dyslexia. He's going to be having trouble with Fountain and Buckingham. 
uh, for the rest of the day. Anyway, they were waving signs that said stuff like F-U-J-B, F-U-J-B, and freedom ain't free, and come on and join our convoy. Actually, I don't know if they had those last two signs. I'm just imagining it. Did. But they had the F-U-J-B sign, according Four to... Four letters? F-U-J-B? According to the Tribune, yeah. Uh, I don't know if they actually spelled it out. And the good news is I have not seen any reports uh, that people were um, waving Confederate flags or carrying signs with swastikas on them or uh, signs with Nazi slogans. So, you know, they're, maybe they're cleaning up their act, eh? Maybe they're saying, you know what, it may not be a good idea to be, like, waving around swastikas. I don't know. But it could just be that the reporter didn't see it or didn't report it, or sometimes these things get cut for space. So, But I did not see any... Uh, item in the paper that they were carrying signs with swastika. So good job, DB, cleaning things up there, all right? And let me just say this. Uh, uh, even though I wasn't there to welcome uh, uh, Darren Bailey and Dennis wasn't there to welcome uh, Darren Bailey, uh, and my wife wasn't there to welcome Darren Bailey, and all my friends, none of us were there to welcome him, I'd like to say that Chicago really is a welcoming town, D. I mean, Darren Bailey is not the friendliest guy in the world of Chicago, but we welcomed him. We said, DB, you want to throw an anti-Pritzker rally at Buckingham Fountain? Knock yourself out. You want to wave signs that say F-U-J-B? Bring it, big feller. You want to just get up there and trash Chicago and trash the people we elect? Go ahead. Now, I'd like to think that I would have the right to throw an anti-Trump rally in Xenia, Clay County, home port to one Darren Bailey, I'd like to think that they would say that have the same attitude toward me that we have toward Darren Bailey. That if I showed up uh, in Clay County with a sign that said F U D T, right? Or D J T, <laughs> they would say, go ahead, Ben, knock yourself out. But I don't know, man. I got a feeling that. Uh, DB's good friend, the judge, the Hang'em High judge, Judge Michael McKinney, he'd probably throw me into jail for disturbing the peace. Not that I would complain, because freedom ain't free. Speaking of Judge McKinney, he's the Hang'em High judge who ruled uh, on behalf of Darren Bailey, said that uh, JB had crossed the line and did not have the authority uh, to force Darren Bailey to abide by stay-at-home orders. Uh, so uh, J Judge McKinney looking out for his good friend, Darren Bailey. There was no indication that he uh, joined uh, Darren Bailey at the protest at uh, Buckingham Fountain, although I think I see him uh, in a video. He's the one uh, carrying the sign that says, come on and join my convoy. Just kidding, at their expense. Anyway, uh, they did the whole Ferris Bueller thing, D, I think, when they were in town. They went to Wrigley Field. They had pizza, deep dish pizza. Uh, they went to the Art Institute. Actually, all these things are closed because of JB. So they couldn't do any of that stuff. Come back next year. Darren Bailey could do all that. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a valid point. Man. Jury's still out. We will be in that studio in two weeks. You hear me there? We will be. That's the goal anyway. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe. Uh, right, D? Yeah. Maybe. Um, anyway, uh you actually, you called it, Dennis. Uh, like I said, about three weeks ago, Dennis said that uh, Darren Bailey would be running for governor. You just watch as soon as Bailey emerged as the leader of the Republican Party in the state of Illinois. Now that Bruce Rauner has left the state, uh, Bruce Rauner is living in Florida. Uh, so Darren Bailey is now the leader of the Republican Party. And uh, so, yes, indeed, he pretty much has announced that he was running at uh, the Monday uh, rally. And at you're Bucking kidding? Is he really? He says. Uh, he, here's his exact quote. If God opens a door, I'll go through that door. <laughs> I'm, that's what he said, all right? Cool. <laughs> you know? It kind of reminds me of Flip Wilson. Back in the day, there's a comedian at Flip Wilson who would do his character or would do something bad uh, that the character shouldn't have done. And Flip Wilson <laughs> said, the devil made me do it. In uh, DB's case, uh, he's saying, God, I'm just, God wants me to do this. Come on, DB. Hope you enjoyed your vacation, Madigan. You're going to start getting... <laughs> Ripped up left and right again. Here comes Darren Bailey. Darren Bailey. Darren, it's God's God. Don't don't put this on God. This is all your ambition. All right, but whatever. God, God opens the door. I'll go through it. Uh, if he does run for governor, he's got a curious way of winning over votes in Chicago. And here is uh, my favorite quote from the uh, speech he gave at Buckingham Fountain D. Uh, here we go. Uh, and I'm reading from uh, an account in the Tribune. Quote: I love Chicago. It's part of Illinois, 
But sometimes when you raise a wayward child, you have to discipline that child. Okay. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that sentence here. First of all, yes, he's correct. Chicago is part of Illinois, but uh, if, That's correct. if the Eastern Bloc, that uh, consortium of downstate legislatures, Republican legislatures, has their way, Chicago will be excised from the rest of Illinois. Remember, D? They wanted to have that movement to kick Chicago out of Illinois. So, like, life would be so much better for them if Chicago wasn't involved. So, yeah, technically it is uh, still part of Illinois, but not if you have your way. And then there's this really curious attitude he has. Sometimes when you raise a wayward child, the hell is he my daddy? He didn't ra Did Darren Bailey, that's why we call him Daddy Darren? Did he raise anyone in the city of Chicago? Are we now his children? And then... You have to discipline that child. I, I think he's going into dominatrix country, D. You know what a dominatrix is? He's going to get out that whip, make us, like, strip down and whack us. <laughs> Darren Bailey, the dominatrix. You have to discipline that child. Man, there's some kinky stuff coming out of oh. Darren Bailey. I don't know, man. I, I uh, Catch Ben Jarofsky's sex column uh, next week on The Reader. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how many votes you're going to pick up in Chicago, uh, Darren Bailey, treating us like we're the wayward child. Like there's something wrong with us, but if you discipline us, we'll be good boys and girls and we'll do whatever you say. I, I don't even know if that would be catch on downstate. I just, it's, it is curious though. You know, whenever Chicago has a problem, it's like something we did wrong. But whenever outside of Chicago has a problem, it's like the evil world has entered Eden. It's just a curious little take on things. It's like, well, we'll discipline Chicago and whack them around. But like when, if there's any kind of trouble down in Clay County, it's like, well, we were good, pure people. And then evil came to town. So, you know, we weren't, we're good, but evil is bad. It's just sort of like Chicago, different attitude about Chicago uh, and downstate. I, but uh, I, I, Darren Bailey, uh, I might want to think about coming up with a new tactic uh, to win over uh, uh, Chicago voters. The reality is this, uh, that most Republicans in the state of Illinois, uh, most Republicans uh, south of Chicago and Cook County, I, I should say, uh, don't think much of JB's stay-at-home order because and uh, they don't think it's necessary. And they don't really think the pandemic's a real thing. And I actually can't, I gotta say this, D, I don't blame them for having an attitude. And that brings to me to perhaps the most uh, significant thing I read this weekend, uh, a very interesting story in the New York Times. It was uh, Monday's New York Times uh, by Jennifer Medina and Robert Gebeloff. I wanna give them a shout out because they did a good job. And the headline is Virus at Its Deadliest in the Strongholds of Democrats. So if you really wanna know why Republicans have such a hostility to stay at home orders, you gotta consider uh, what uh, Jennifer Medina and Robert Gebeloff discovered when they took a deep dive into uh, the parts of the country that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic. And this is sort of their uh, take-home paragraph. Quote, Democrats are far more likely to live in counties where the virus has ravaged the community, while Republicans more likely to live in counties that have been relatively unscathed by the illness, though they are paying an economic price. Here you go, folks. Follow this one. Counties won by President Trump in 2016 have reported just 27% of the virus infections and 21% of the deaths, even though 45% of Americans live in those communities, a New York Times analysis has discovered. In other words, it's not hitting them as hard as it's hitting blue cities like Chicago or blue counties like Cook County. I'll go further with this one. They really did a deep dive. Did I get to? Nope, got to the wrong page. D, hold on. Up there. Oh, hold See on, that dude. newspaper, listeners? Oh, come on. Almost there. There we go. All right. Let's just take the deep dive here. Uh, if seeing is believing, the infection has simply come to some areas of the country on a far different scale than others. As of Friday, Alabama had 11 deaths per 100,000 residents, and New Jersey had lost 122 per 100,000. Both states have had a huge spike in unemployment claims. So it's hit harder at New Jersey, which is a blue state, than it's hit at Alabama, which is a red state. 
Thus, Alabamians, who are Trump voters by and large, wear the MAGA hat, proudly ha see no reason to have stay-at-home orders. All right. Even in a state like Texas, which is solid Republican, uh, there's a breakdown between blue areas and red areas. And I'm quoting from the article again. The state's biggest cities have so far escaped the worst of its damage. More than 200 metro areas in the United States have higher infection rates than both Dallas and Houston, which may explain why Texas residents are particularly frustrated by the shutdown. Quote, the cure is worse than the disease, no doubt says a Republican in Texas. There are businesses that were shut down and are never going to open again, quote, uh, end of quote. Overall, the infection rate is 1.7 times as high in most er urban areas of the country compared with nearby suburbs and 2.3 times as high in the suburbs as exurban areas and rural areas. A recent spate of outbreaks in meat plants, prisons, and nursing homes has created hotspots in 245 counties that supported Mr. Trump, double the number at the beginning of the month. Some of those outbreaks are hitting subsets of the population that historically have not voted for Republicans. In Iowa, for example, Latinos make up 6% of the population, but nearly a third of those infected. The population is 4% black, but 12% of those infected are black. So even in red states or states that went for Trump, like Donald Trump, uh, excuse me, that went for Trump, like Iowa, the infection rate is higher among traditional Democratic voters. And a lot of this has to do with, of course, uh, the fact that uh, the areas that are hit harder are more congested, so the disease spreads uh, more rapidly. Uh, so, you know, there's... Um, medical and scientific explanations why Democrats have been hard, hit harder. It's not like the virus is picking on Democrats. It's not like it only uh, goes after Democrats. But it's easy to see how some Trump supporters might view this as a disease that doesn't affect them. And as a result, yes, from their perspective, there is no need to have stay at home. And yes, from their perspective, it's gone too far. You know, I got to give a shout out to Candace Castillo on this show. She was absolutely right. And she pointed out that the Operation Gridlock uh, movement, the FUJB movement, to use the sign that uh, appeared at Buckingham Fountain this uh, Monday, the MAGA hat wearings, fist in the air, defying the Democratic governor movement, began at roughly the same time that the MAGA hat wearers figured out that the death rate for black people was higher than the death rate for white people. Candace came on this show about three weeks ago and said it, D, and she was prophetic. She was absolutely correct. They came to the conclusion that it was other people dying from this virus, so F them. They might have just as well have said F U Chicago as opposed to F U J B. Now, Here's this quote from the New York Times. I figure this, this is a quote that sort of sums it all up. It's from a Mrs. Bridal, a 42-year-old mother of five who lives in Texas. Uh, she says she has a minister she know who died after contracting the virus. Even so, she said she and her friends were more focused on freedom than on health. Quote, I guess other people expect us to set our futures on fire to keep their fear warm. I think that's incredibly selfish. If you're that fearful then just stay home. That kind of reminds me of that quote your dad used to say, D, remember that quote? He goes, if you're scared, go to church. Remember that quote? So if you're so fearful, just stay at home. I'll tell you what, I can understand why she has that attitude, but it's pretty cold hearted. I'd like to think, I had talked about this with Dennis earlier today. I like to think that if it was reversed, that if this disease was hitting hard at areas that I don't live in, that I would show a little more compassion for the people who are hit hardest by, and also a realization that the trend could turn and I too may be infected. I wouldn't just, I would hope I would show just a little more compassion for people who are suffering uh, than so many of my MAGA hat wearing counterparts, my MAGA hat wearing brothers and sisters in red states. I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I think they'd be singing a different tune if the virus uh, was hitting hard in their hometowns. I guess freedom really is free if someone else is paying the price. We got a great show today, everybody. State Senator Rob Martlick will be here. He's got a lot to report about last week's session in Springfield. When I say Robert, you say Martwick. Robert! 
Robert! You know, and I, uh, just instinctively, I almost call him State Representative Mark. Stop Wiggins. doing that. I know, but you you got me. You said Senator Mark. I go, Senator? I go, yes, he's now a state senator. Uh, for several years, he was a state representative Robert! on the Northwest side. Robert! So we were talking about the casino, the budget. Uh, oh, man, you know, we'll talk about uh, how uh, vote by mail. It's got a lot of interesting things to say by vote, <laughs> vote by mail. Vote by mail. And also his mail. heroic and courageous drive to Springfield. Uh, which is a story that will probably be uh, turned into a movie anytime soon. Oh, so wow. Rob Martwick will be on with us. But before we do that, the young man from Alton, the man they call Dr. Doobie, with the news. Hey, guys, no one calls me that. Um, <laughs> really? He's, he's talking about a, his, his car ride to Springfield? Mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, well, I'll allow him to tell the story, but the, uh, this is called the teaser in the business, D. Uh, he wasn't going to go, but they thought he needed his vote because... Well, he'll tell the story. Let, let, let Rob Martwick tell the story. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, that's going to be coming up a little later on. And before we go any further here, a uh, couple things we want to run by. First off, hey, have you checked out the latest Benny J bonus interviews? Well, they're available at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else. You download your favorite podcast. Uh, Alder Woman, Jeanette Taylor was one of our bonus interviews go check that out we had david ferris and who was the other one ben i really can't remember offhand e z eric zorn eric zorn easy e guys go check those out both chicago sun times and chicago reader websites and yeah wherever else you download podcasts so that's one thing the other thing uh after this week we're taking next week off all right so yeah we're uh, gonna try to transition back into the sun times uh We'll see how that goes, but uh, we're going to take next week off, see, uh, play it by ear. Maybe I'll go in the Sun Times and give a look around, see if I feel safe, if it looks good. <laughs> I think we should be fine, though, right, Ben? Yeah, uh, it, clean the place out, make sure we have wipes there. Uh, I have to write to that reader best of. That's something I got to do, D. Yeah, but putting it off and putting it off, uh-uh. So I'm going to be uh, working feverishly. Uh, putting together my best of. We had Lior Galil on talking about his best of, and the readers say, hey, Ben, come on now. Hurry up. Get those stories in. So I'll be doing that. I'll be a busy guy uh, next week. And also, I just want to say, while we're gone, we're going we're gonna to go into our uh, vault greatest hits. We have over 500 shows. Yeah. Over 500 shows. Yeah, we, that's why we're taking a little break. All <laughs> we're right? grinders, man. <laughs> you really do the job. Over 500 shows since we started. And I'm going to go through and pluck out some of the greatest hits. Be that Ben Jarofsky show, they pack a lunch. <laughs> they pack. The DB loves us. He says, where, uh, he's like a F Buckingham Fountain. Hey. Oh, man. Where, hey, where's that Giordano's, <laughs> man? I love that place. You actually, I actually showed him around town. You didn't ask me. Oh, uh, I didn't know, know I showed, that. Yeah, I showed Darren Baylor around town. Where'd you take him? Uh, Giordano's, as he <laughs> calls it. Did, oh, what? now where the hell's that Giordano's at? <laughs> I like that place. Uh, <laughs> deep, deep, deep dish. Uh, DB loves Giordano's. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, I don't yeah. like them cubbies. <laughs> he, he went to Wrigley Field. He did the whole Ferris Bueller thing. Okay? I know. I know. Jealous. You uh, are so jealous. I was jealous that you got to hang with him, and I didn't, apparently. I know. Oh, Drew Ordornos. There it is. By the way, let's bring out for the greatest hits. So when we're gone, we're going to be dropping some of our, uh, our greatest hits. I've got that Lori Lightfoot interview from when she was a candidate. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm just curious. To, we should pluck that one out of the... the, <laughs> she, made, the she made fun of our studio. <laughs> yeah, she did. What, am I in your bedroom? I, as I recall... Oh, here we go. For 10 trivia points, oh, Jesus. who was the other guest in the studio that day? It was Mark Sims. Very good. Excellent. All right, so that's what we're going to do uh, while uh, we're gone for the week. We'll throw up some oldies, but goodies. All right, so be on the lookout for that. And the final announcement I want to make here, Michael Girardi, you know him, you love him. He has great hits like the editorial board and bailout. Today, we are debuting the latest song from Michael Girardi. That's right. It's called Tax Increment Financing. Boy, you really know how to get on the Ben Jarofsky <laughs> show, pal. Make a song called Tax Increment Financing. That's right. Michael Girardi, his debut, Tax Increment Financing. That's going to be coming up before our interview with Rob Martwick. All right, so there's that. Now let's talk about what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. Today, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker will be all together now delivering his COVID-19 press briefing at 2.30 at the Thompson Center. That's correct. Good job, everybody. 
On Sunday, the governor gave us the good news. So long, phase two, because we are now entering phase three Ooh, okay. of J.B. Pritzker's five-phase strategy to restore Illinois. Let's begin with phase one. Right, now, why would we do that, J.B.? Phase one's over. <laughs> uh, by the way, can I just say one thing? What? Insecure. Oh, Tony, Tony, Tone? Uh, Raphael Sadiq. Oh, Raphael just, Sadiq. It just came to me. How did you know that's a... God, we've been together a long time. He goes, it just came to me. I'm looking at him on his phone. <laughs> no, it just came to me. Yeah, it just came to me. I saw Wikipedia up. Okay, so uh, Jay Marie weighed in on the live stream chat and said that as well. Oh, she knew? Yeah, yeah. Jay Marie, insecure. I saw Issa Rae movie uh, yesterday, Lovebirds. Have you seen that one, Jay Marie? Not bad. Anyway, go ahead, Dean. Yeah, let's talk about movies while I'm reading the news. Uh, oh, sure, sorry. yeah, what else? What sorry. else? Yeah, let's have a little private conversation. Hey, be easy. It's me, not him, all right? Yeah, hey, it ahead. really is. All right, now, oh, there's the brown line and the air conditioner. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> we're going back next week, guys. <laughs> Two weeks, man. We're going back. And all by right. the way, we, we may, you know, just like we, we'll discuss it, maybe not have so many guests in, you know, but take precaution, right, Dean? Wear the mask, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's up to it's up to them if they we're not gonna be like, oh, get in here. Ben used to twist people's arm back in CPT days. Uh, no arm twisting anymore. All right. First off, it's unsanitary. Second off, they they can come in if they want. If not, we can give them an, a phone interview. All right. Now, I was just talking about uh, Pritzker. He said we're gonna be in phase three. Ben interrupted me, and then we got way sidetracked. All right. So we're about to enter phase three. But now, keep in mind. Our Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot said last week that Chicago may not necessarily follow the state's timeline for easing restrictions, but said that the city would be releasing additional guidance for restaurants soon. So as to what that means in regards to these phase three guidelines I'm about to read, well, your guess is as good as mine. But let's read over this and see what we learn. Ben, please feel free to interrupt and weigh in at any time, okay? okay? Yeah. All right. All right. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times staff. Ooh. We miss you all dearly. Two weeks, all right? <laughs> we'll see you again. I don't know. I don't know if they'll be there. Oh, we, well, it could just be you and me. I think uh, we're going to start the trend. I think they're all listening, and they're going to go, oh, wow, they're back in the studio. Oh, yeah. I, guess, I guess we should go, too, because the whole staff listens to the show. All right. Uh, in addition to social distancing, wearing masks, and hand washing, phase three of Pritzker's plan includes some specific guidelines for places like gyms, hair salons, and day camps. Youth sports activities are limited to drills, practices, and lessons that involve no contact between kids and allow for six feet of social distancing to be maintained. So uh, no football, that's for sure, right? No football, yeah. A lot of contact in that Yeah, sport. a lot of, oh my God, there was, did you see the article? I know we're on a tangent here, but the article in the Tribune about football, okay. about their, the football, what's, I can't, Don Wiederer, I think is his name. Uh, they're, they're actually talking about bringing the NFL back, D. Which is like, wow, how are they going to pull that off? Because in baseball, they're going to do all the social distancing. There's going to be maybe some basketball. Oh, I'm so excited about that. Uh, but in, I don't know how in the world they're going to play football. Uh, but the guy was talking about it. Foot, he, the, the writer was talking about it. Football, the snot and the saliva and the spit is flying. <laughs> I was like, wow, these football writers really get into it. Uh, yeah, I don't know how they're going to bring football back to you. Go ahead. Fitness classes are limited to one-on-one -on -one training. Outdoor classes with a maximum of 10 participants and no contact between attendees. Personal care services like those you get at hair salons, barber shops, nail salons, spas, massage parlors, waxing centers, and tattoo parlors can only be performed while the customer and employee are both wearing face masks. Uh, massages and body treatments like masks and scrubs are limited to 30 minutes or less. Camps can only take place during the day. Overnight camps are not allowed. Restaurants and bars can be open for outdoor dining only and limited to parties of six people or fewer. Mm. The governor stressed that as more businesses reopen, the top priority will continue to be the health and safety of Illinois residents and workers, and he urged Illinois residents to continue to take precautions. The governor's office estimates about 700,000 Illinois residents will be able to return to work in phase three. And that will start exactly... I believe after the 29th. 29th, yes. My wife is waiting to hear from Lori Life. We talked about this because, all right, you know, there's the proclamation by J.B. Pritzker, which 
is for the state of Illinois, but in the city of Chicago, the mayor gets a say, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, so she reserves the right to be more restrictive if necessary. So my wife, the hairdresser, and many hairdressers are waiting for the message from Lori Lightfoot. So, you know, it's like two proclamations. Where's DB when we need him, huh? Darren Bailey, free him, ain't free. Uh, I don't know. You know, you know, it's funny. We're, I mean, we're all being very cautious, and we're all being good citizens. Uh, we've moved to our attic, et cetera. But, D, have you noticed the rest of the country doesn't seem to be following the precepts over the weekend? Huge gatherings. Uh, at the beaches throughout the country, nobody wearing a mask, no mask in sight. We already saw the picture. We talked about it last week in Wisconsin. Gatherings at bars, not a mask in sight. People right next to each other drinking, you know, s- spraying like crazy. That's what you do in bars, huh? So, I mean, it's it's almost it's almost like a parody of itself. You know, the, how we're dutifully following the orders of our governor while the rest of the country is you know just party on it's like the teacher one class in the school is really following the rules and doing what the teacher says and the rest of the school is just like rocking out in the bathroom or something so it's very to quote you a very mixed message and of course uh donald trump this weekend uh, memorial day was playing golf no mask on uh, joe b joey biden when he went out to uh lay a wreath at a uh uh, in a ceremony for Memorial Day, he and his wife were wearing masks. To, so Donald Trump doesn't wear a mask. Joe Biden doesn't. So we're really divided. This country is so divided on this issue. So many issues. It's, uh, but this one is is really at the top of the of the charts. And um, you know, so I'm falling in line with with JB. I'm with him. I think he's done a good job as our governor in this tough times, uh, having to deal with nothing else and then like you know, the Darren Baileys of the world, but I don't know, man. I think the rest of the country has decided the hell with this stay at home. We're going to party. I don't think it's the rest of the country. It's just like Illinois only. You know, there's other places doing well, well right? Let, let's put it this way. The uh, the red part of this country has decided the hell. With- and then, I, like I said, there's our people who just, there's nothing political about it. They're just tired of staying at home. They want to go to the beach. Like I said, they figure it's like smoking cigarettes, so they're, they're willing to take their chances. They're pl- people who are making political statements and people who are just stir-crazy. All right, let's move on here. Another city news. Finally, an answer to the question that at least no one in my circle of friends in the city of Chicago has ever asked me since this all started. What about the tourists? <laughs> The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times and Stephanie Zimmerman. The headline reads, Chicago's new normal. When will the tourists come back? (laughs) Unlike some places that have hurtled toward a rapid reopening, Chicago wants to be viewed as an intelligent destination that visitors can trust. Yes, turns out it's much easier to lie to people who are only here for the weekend. Yeah, wait, time out. (laughs) People did actually you, live here. It's tough. Wait, time out. Did you, I did. did you, was that? Did Stephanie write that? No. Or, oh, that's really funny. <laughs> wait, I'm go, glad you're surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what did she write? That Chicago wants to be known as an intelligent destination that visitors can trust. Okay. Yeah. Visitors may be able to trust. <laughs> but any as the song uh, by Michael Girardi on Tiff's could show. It really pays not to trust anything that our leaders say in the city of Chicago, at least when it comes to tips. So it's a a very intelligent city, Uh, uh, you know, except for when it votes on its mayoral candidate. Yeah, we prefer that those people come back. Their visitors are really easy to lie to. We Uh, miss them. (laughs) Visitors will believe anything. Well, it's a really intelligent city. These people who live here just sticks in the mud. My God. Zimmerman continues, now it's clear that Chicago tourism numbers won't reach anywhere (laughs) close to previous levels until there's a COVID-19 vaccine or effective treatment. Mm -hmm. Chicago has drawn more than 55 million domestic and international visitors annually for the past several years, lured in part by summer offerings like Ben's favorite Lollapalooza <laughs> yeah. and Millennial uh, Millennium Park concerts, as well as year-round draws like the Art Institute and once again Ben's favorite Navy Pier. <laughs> oh, that, that's where DB went, Navy Pier. You know he went to Navy Pier. Darren Bailey was in town on Monday. Let's go to Navy Pier. Went- well, I've been on bigger and better Ferris wheels. <laughs> that one's okay, I guess. Hey, 
you took the Hagem High Judge McHaney. They went down the. They were on the Ferris wheel together, D. Where's Giordano's at? <laughs> Uh, got that line about the intelligent <laughs> visitors, very intelligent. Chicago, it's uh, not that it will fall for anything. The, <laughs> the city has also benefited from a travel and tourism boom boosted by the strong economy that followed the 2008 Great Recession, with 153,000 uh, jobs tied to Chicago tourism in 2019. But that was before the coronavirus pandemic upturned the whole world. Yes, add another industry to the list of those heavily affected by COVID-19, the tourism industry. What's the backup plan for tourism if a pandemic breaks out? Well, obviously there isn't one, but don't worry. <laughs> because the heavily funded members of Choose Chicago are finding a way to keep tourism alive. How are they going to do that? <laughs> Great question, Ben Jarofsky. I mean, if you're afraid of catching the virus, if, I mean... If the city's on like a lockdown, if there are no restaurants to go to, how are they going to bring the tourists back, D? <laughs> Unless they come here to protest at Buckingham Fountain like uh, Darren Bailey, you know, and his cadre of pals. Why are they going to come to Chicago? What's the plan? Choose Chicago, the organization charged with boosting Chicago's image. <laughs> was hit Chicago's image. Yeah, huh? that was... Well, they did a lot of boosting after Chicago decided to reelect Rahm in 2015. Yeah, some heavy lifting. Oh. Choose Chicago was hit hard by the loss of hotel and airline passenger yeah. tax revenues, which uh, the privately run organization says funded $24 million of its $31 million budget last year. The tourism group is now throwing its efforts into showcasing Chicago as a safe place where reopening protocols are based on public health and science, says board chairman Glenn Eden. He's the executive vice president with the public relations firm Weber Shandwick. <laughs> I don't know that group. Me don't either. know him either. But, man, I'll tell you what, you got a tough job. What are you like? We're. <laughs> You, we can't go anywhere. We can't eat anywhere. We, we like got to wear masks. How about you try convincing people to stay that live here <laughs> rather than trying to get people that don't live here to visit? Oh, uh, God. Actually, well, I'm not going to go there. Be go there. No, cynical, jaded comment by me, uh, which we don't need anymore. We need more positivity. Look, I love the tourists as much as anybody. They can come on in and... Have any tourists ever come by to take a look at our show? And the old, we had one a visiting student. Remember that there was a visiting student. Well, I saw some weirdo by the porta potty with a camera. <laughs> that, uh, that was Darren Bailey. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, this is really a challenge uh, to to try to get tourists to come to Chicago when we've, the restaurants are closed. The museums are closed. Navy Pier is closed. Everybody's wearing a mask. But we're really intelligent. So maybe they'll just come to Chicago and have intelligence conversations with us about well, maybe, TIFFs. Now, this new campaign, there's a new campaign called Tourism and Hospitality Forward. It encourages hotels, restaurants, museums, and other attractions to pledge to keep socially responsible health and cleanliness measures top of mind for both visitors and employees and to display that info on websites and other communications with the drop in international visitors the organization sees locals as well as residents of the upper midwest as the most likely to visit here first the city plans to highlight neighborhood attractions as a way to offer quote exploration and adventure for these nearby visitors experts agree that trust will be key to restoring chicago's tourism here's a quote from Kent Grayson. Oh, this is what we need, a marketing guy in times of a pandemic. Yeah. You know, I want to know what a marketer has to say uh, during pandemic times. So luckily, uh, this feller, Kent Grayson, has weighed in. He says, quote, if you already have a trustworthy brand, this is the time to use it. You know, I, I didn't see uh, the bars of Wisconsin, the inns of Wisconsin worried about trust. You know what I'm saying? As soon as the uh, Supreme Court said they can open, man, we're open. You don't have to wear a mask. You can sit on top of each other at a bar. You can spray on each other. So I don't know. It's um, it's a crazy time. Uh, I, I Listen, what a challenge to be the marketing guy in charge of promoting tourism in Chicago right, when like everything is closed. 
Like, are, does everybody have toilet paper now? Like, we're worried about the toilet now. Like, hey, let's get tourism going on now. So, but it, I guess I guess I can see where they're going with this marketing. And by the way, I, I, I don't mean to diminish the PR marketing industry. Uh, Lord knows I would be terrible at it. But I'm just throwing this out there, thinking about this. So I guess what they're saying is, um, you're in Chicago, you won't catch the virus. Is that what they're kind of, is that kind of like... <laughs> Their theme is not a D. I is, think that's the spin. That's the yeah, but they, they don't like come right out and say it that way. They say well, they're so intelligent in Chicago. Hey man, no wonder they don't allow me to go anywhere near a marketing guy in Chicago. Because as soon as someone says Chicago is so intelligent, I start talking about their electoral decisions they've made over the last you know thirty years since Harold Washington died. And just imagine a group of like five people getting together talking about tourism, tourism in Chicago right now. Like, where's the one person in the group to be like, hey, uh, I don't know, what if we just don't <laughs> talk about that or work on people touring right now? You know what I mean? Tourists, let me tell you about the intelligence of Chicago voters. Like, how let's they, park that. They took th how many millions of TIF dollars that were supposed to for the South Loop and spend it on Navy Pier? Hey, that's a real intelligent town. <laughs> Come on, Ben. That's cynical and jaded. And Chicago really is an intelligent town. Dude. That's correct. Okay. Well, we wish choose Chicago the best of luck in that endeavor. And regardless if they succeed or not, just know that Illinois lawmakers are holding up to their end of the bargain on bringing in tourists because on Saturday, they approved a Chicago casino. Okay. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Hot damn! <laughs> Finally! Uh, we'll talk to uh, Rob Markwick about this one. The, Go ahead, the Illinois General Assembly worked into the late hours to approve a 41 billion dollar maintenance budget plan that's largely reliant on borrowing and hope that the federal government will further help Illinois with COVID-19 relief. A pandemic spending package to get, to get Illinois through the rest of the year and next passed early Sunday. Saturday marked the fourth day of an unprecedented special session. The Illinois Senate approved the casino plan 42 to 14 and it will be sent to Governor J.B. Pritzker's desk it marked a huge feat for Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who achieved what several Chicago mayors could not. Bill sponsor Senator Bill Cunningham, a Democrat out of Chicago, said that the state's capital programs will get $45 million up front in licensing fees before the casino is even opened. And the state will receive an additional $700 million in a reworked reconciliation fee. I have the quote from Cunningham here, quote, it's fair to say that over the next handful of years, the Chicago casino is going to provide hundreds of millions of dollars, indeed well over a billion dollars to our capital program. That's a lot of dough, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you, by the way, you remember Bill Cunningham? He was on the show. Oh yeah, I do remember him. I, I owe him a lunch. Yeah, that's I like- I lost a bet to him. Like 20 people you owe lunches <laughs> to. I know, I lost a bet. Well, there's probably more that owe me, but I always forget the bets. But uh, yeah, we he, I didn't think Jeannie Ives was going to run for governor, and he predicted she would. Boy, they, they throwing these numbers out. Go ahead, D. I love when they, the big numbers up front throw them. That's all I got. Well, I do have another quote from uh, Cunningham here. Uh, Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> oh, wow. He's ready to go gambling. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, listen. we got to raise money to uh, pay all our obligations, so... I got mixed feelings about casinos. You're not going to catch me in one. It's a sucker's game. They, it, the whole thing is set up to make you lose, and people go anyway. If you're happy losing, God bless you. Who am I to say, D, right? Uh, one man's meat is another man's poison. Isn't that a saying? <laughs> Trash one, and treasure. <laughs> so uh, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. There's many That's correct saying it. Thank you, uh, Robert Mueller. So uh, this is how the state's going to pay its bills. This is how we're going to do it. Hey, let me give a little shout out to Lori Lightfoot. She got a pass, right, D? Okay. Yeah. They did kind of some finagling with the money, but huge pots of money were. This gets back to the intelligence of, well, this would be the entire state of Illinois. We're not that smart when they start moving the money around. Don't tell the people in the tourist trade that, D, okay? They're trying to promote us as an intelligent place. <laughs> intelligent, like they move the money around. <laughs> They, well, we there's not enough here. We move it there, but move it, nobody. But by the time it's done, we're like, what happened? To all that money? Don't ask questions. All right, don't be so intelligent. So anyway, I'm going to give a shout out to Lori Lightfoot. She got it passed. Uh, the notion of, as I said, of a casino uh, in Chicago in the midst of the pandemic. 
I don't know, D. It seems a little extreme. Uh, you know, you and I are very are talking very cautiously about going to our beloved little studio and, you know, all the the protocol we're going to follow. And dude, just, I'm scared to go into Popeyes. <laughs> right. The notion, the notion that like thousands of people will pack a casino, standing <laughs> on top of each other, rolling dice or playing blackjack. You know, you could better sanitize those cards. So I don't know. You know what? But I, I think you have to think big, ultimately. And so eventually this pandemic will pass. Uh, we'll come up with a vaccine. And, you know, we can start soaking all the saps to come to Chicago and using the, those proceeds to pay our uh, pension obligations. Uh, Jeff Johnson will be a guest. Mm, well, not next week, two weeks from now. And we'll, we'll talk about how this is going to impact pensions. Uh, the police and firefighters, I believe, are at the top of the list to get uh, money from the casino uh, if the casino comes to Chicago. So, you know what? Got to pay the bills, D. Got to pay the bills. Got to pay the bills. And, hey, Mayor Lightfoot, when this casino opens, meet Jarofsky over at the blackjack <laughs> table, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah! Hot damn! Let's go gambling. All right, and finally, ever since he's become a weekend political pundit, well, it's one of my favorite things to do on a Tuesday. It's time to find out how much horse shit our former mayor, Rahm Emanuel, was shoveling on television, huh? Oh, oh, oh. Well, there goes the WBEZ gig, Nick. Long gone, pal. Long gone. It's all right, man. Apparently, the Chicago <laughs> Tribune likes to talk about it as well. Right now in my face is a tri tribunal piece from Bill Ruthhart. Ben, what do we know about Mr. Ruthhart? He's a pretty good reporter, a political reporter. I remember he was the one, we, he, we dissected one of his stories. He went to Michigan. Remember this day? He went to Michigan uh, and he interviewed uh, General Motors, I think it was, and strikers who were supporting oh, Trump. I know. I remember, Mayor I know Rahm went to Michigan. I just biked around Lake Michigan. <laughs> and how many miles did you go? Nearly a thousand miles. Oh, my goodness. Did you see anybody who wanted health care? No, <laughs> not anybody. He, he went all throughout the state of Michigan, couldn't find anybody who wanted health care. They love their health care. Thank you, Mayor Rahm. Yeah, he's wearing spandex. Did you know that, D, when he went on that bike trip? Yeah, or... that's, I heard about that. But you were telling us about Ruthart? Yeah, he wrote it pretty. Remember that story? We talked about it, uh, about uh, General Motors strikers who were supporting Trump anyway. It was like, wow, man. That's some deep stuff. You know, Donald Trump has never done anything for the labor movement in this country except for just try to destroy it. And some people on the strike, on the picket line, uh, were supporting him. And then there was the interesting thing, like, so Trump hadn't showed up at the pickets. This is an old story, but Trump hadn't showed up, but various Democrats showed up, I think, to show their support. I think Bernie was there, had shown up. This is before pandemic, right? Uh, I think Elizabeth Warren may have come by. Uh, Grandpa Joe may have showed up. Joe Biden, I want to well, I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. That's correct. Oh, God, Joey P. Oh, my goodness. I, anyway, I'm sorry. Just went on a tangent there, Joey B. I think Joe Biden showed up, too. But the attitude of some of the strikers was, well, we expect them to show up. They're Democrats. I'm like, what is the logic of that? So that doesn't. So the fact that they show up and support you, that doesn't matter. You know, well, yeah, they're supposed to do that. So Trump gets a pass. Man, I tell you what, the bar is low for Trump. He gets a pass. He doesn't have to sh support them because he's not expected to support them. So he makes their life difficult, but they don't care because what? They like his comb over? I don't know. Anyway, that's my memory of uh, Bill Ruthart. No collusion. <laughs> okay. All uh, right. Are you a doctor by any chance, uh, Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't have that one. Oh, my God. Come on, man. See? <laughs> Can only do so much here. You pull that one off, BEZ. He's like, ooh, we're impressed. Okay, enough of the BEZ <laughs> thing, okay? I applied like six times, and they never talked to me. Okay, now, <laughs> Ruthhart lets it rip here, all right? Let's talk about Ruthhart. All right. Uh, he says here in the Chicago Tribune, Rahm Emanuel is having regular conversations with presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden and his top advisors about economic policy the selection of a running mate, and the political uh, machinations of taking on President Donald Trump. 
Big words the Tribune uses. Uh, while Chicago's former mayor is keeping the specifics to himself, oh. he offered some hints about his counsel while mic'd up during a round of recent television and podcast appearances. And this is where I really think we got uh, the the threat of the lawsuit by playing audio from ABC and Rahm Emanuel. You so think we're so? I know so. I, I'm, wait, I'm wait. almost convinced that that's what it's wait, from. Wait, come on. You, th you really It's do? not anything personal. It's just that it's ABC. And, you know, we played like uh, several minutes of audio. Well, I don't think them. this audio that uh, the Tribune referred to uh, in their story is from ABC. Let's just play it anyway. See, well, let's do an experiment. What the hell? It's a pandemic. Well, much like that one thing you <laughs> queued me up to play, I don't have it either. So uh -oh. I'm just reading it. By the way, can I, just before you read it, I just thought, what an interesting thing that Joe Biden uh, would turn to, of all people, Rahm Emanuel for advice. I bet you it was Rom who told him to go on that radio show and say, uh, you ain't black. I bet you that was Rom's advice. Here's what you do to win over the black vote. Yeah, that's the guy I would listen to, Rahm Emanuel of Laquan McDonald tape. Joe Biden. Why would Joe Biden listen to Rahm Emanuel, D? Of all the people. Among Emanuel's ideas, Democrats should stop looking timid on oh. reopening the country amid the coronavirus pandemic and offer a bold plan to rebuild the nation's infrastructure. While millions of Americans are stuck on unemployment, the government should pay for them to be trained for future jobs in coding and cybersecurity. And it's time Democrats push for a new deal 2.0 with guarantees on retirement security, health care, and college education. As for the selection of a running mate, Emmanuel said the decision is more important than usual. It's me! Pick me! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. But that's what he was thinking. You need someone smart like me. <laughs> Biden is, it says here, Biden is 77 and would take office amid health and economic crisis. Uh, but that policy direction is at least as important for the former vice president. Revealing his standing in Biden's orbit uh, helps a man. Okay, you get the point. By the way, can we just advice. pause for a moment? Stop look. I remember I read that. I read that. It, his advice is to stop looking timid in the pandemic. Thanks for support. That's just so classic Rom. Gonna throw all the Democrats under a bus and drive over it. Someone like he's so smart. You know, J.B. Pritzker's under siege in the state of Illinois because he's been a leader, a strong leader, trying to look out for the people. You could say, well, he's gone too far, that he, he shouldn't treat all counties the same. You could have an argument, a legitimate argument, whether he went too far or was too extreme. But he, I think you could actually say he was looking out for people's best interest, okay? And then he's got to deal with the DBs of the world, the Darren Bailey's of the world, and the Hang'em High Judge McCainy of the world who come to Chicago to Buckingham. Oh, I don't know if McCainy was there. They eat our pizza, and then they, you know, threaten to spank us and they say they're taking away the liberties and here comes rom right on time classic rom emmanuel sounding like a republican don't be so timid well, how would you've done it mayor rom if you were the mayor thank goodness i always say this when whenever my lefty friends come in here and sort of you know criticize Lori lightfoot i go well guys at least you have to say she's better than rom and most of them kind of go, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't ever notice that? Like, they don't want to say anything nice about Lori Lightfoot, so they sort of go, <laughs> which is their way of saying, yeah, okay, she is better. But I they, hear my wife calling me. <laughs> think, think of that. Like, Lori Lightfoot has closed down the lakefront, closed the restaurants, closed hair salons, got everybody wearing a mask because she's really concerned about the health and safety of Chicagoans. She doesn't want all these Chicagoans to die. And here comes Mayor Rahm. She doesn't want Chicagoans to die on her watch. She doesn't want to feel responsible for the death of people of disease past. Here comes Mayor Rahm. Stop looking so timid. Thanks for nothing, Mayor Rahm. Good. God. I'll tell you what, the man, you know, he hangs out with Republicans all the time, D. And he ends up sounding like a Republican. Stop being so timid. We can't be the party of timidity. What would you do if you were the mayor of the city of Chicago, Rom? What, no masks? Open up uh, Navy Pier? Have the Ferris wheel going? Restaurants? Make it like Lake Geneva, Wisconsin? People just show up? Yeah, don't be so timid, says the guy who wimped out of the election. Yes! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you for saying... Hey, BEZ, he, he just did that on Stop his own, Stop the right? BEZ thing. <laughs> Come on, BZ, man it up. Anyway, but you're absolutely Mr. I'm tough guy. I'm not afraid of anything. Yeah, he, they showed him those internal polls. He goes, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> now he's gone giving advice. Stop being so timid. Oh, okay, Mayor Rahm. Thanks for nothing. We're trying to hold this all together. We got these, you know, uh, 
MAGA hat wearers with their signs, F U J B, and here comes Mayor Rom. Stop being so timid. I'm going to stop my timer right now. Okay. It's been 22 years since I heard someone say, Sia wouldn't want to be here. <laughs> who said it then? That was a record. <laughs> no, I actually said it before. You just weren't paying attention. <laughs> who, do you know who uh, said it before, 22 years ago? I was like a really young kid. I can't remember the last time someone said that. I think John Sally said it. Remember John Sally? Yeah, I remember John Sally. And who is John Sally? Basketball player. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Those his sports. Okay, over. guys, we're gonna be done now. Uh, so coming up. Wait, the... wait, wait! It's not more Mayor Rahm. More That's great it. advice. That's it. <laughs> he has. Don't be timid, Democrats. <laughs> be like me. I'm bold. I ran for re-election. Uh, Rahm, the polls show that nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. Uh, I think I'll become a, a hedge fund operators and give advice. Don't be timid. All right, everybody. Coming up, we're going to be talking with Rob Martwick. But remember, all right, uh, after this week, we're taking the week off. Mm. And then we're going to try to head back to the Chicago Sun-Times studio. That's right. No more brown line. I know. You may be bummed out. You guys get But we're going to bring the porta potty <laughs> Yeah. We're bringing the porta potty with us, Dave. There you okay? go. Ben's ready to get back to that water fountain. Oh, about that. By the women's bathroom, <laughs> and he creeps everybody out when he w goes and gets water. Well, it wasn't my idea to put the water fountain right where they put it. All right, but we're going to be taking the week off next week, and then we're going to try to get back to the studio. Probably still going to be doing over the phone interviews and Zoom. Ben's favorite, but you know we're transitioning back into the normal show. We're going to try our best. At Jeff least. Johnson will show up. Jeff Johnson will be. I talked to Jim Coogan. Jim Coogan will be a guest. Oh, hey Ben. <laughs> when we return that first week, I don't know if he'll come in the studio. But uh, he'll be one of our guests. So we're already booking guesty for when we return. And by the way, there's no 100% guarantee that we'll be back in the studio. Just putting that out there. I mean, we're going to That's really, the plan, yeah, right? That's that's the plan. We're gonna You're going to ride your bike there? I mean, if it's not raining, yeah, I'll try and ride my bike there. So, oh, speaking of uh, Mr. Bike, uh, Dave Glowatz will be a guest this week. I can't wait. He's got the city council report, D. So it's one of uh, our favorite... Uh, Special. Look at the bird. Oh my God, a bird just flew. Oh, great. No one can see that. <laughs> a bird literally just. Anyway. Threw what it. did it do? It flew up to the window. It was looking in right there at the screen. Oh. Now he's like, sure, Ben. Sure, you saw the bird. Then he saw a birdie. <laughs> anyway. All right, everybody. Rob Martwick is going to be coming up. Uh, right now is the time. Don't go anywhere, everybody, because we have a brand new song to play from our good friend Michael Girardi. Ben hasn't heard this yet. The song is called Tax Increment Financing. Uh, this is the fourth song, actually, from Michael Girardi. Uh, he has another song. I haven't. I didn't download one of these other ones. I'll play it some other time. Uh, but uh, you've heard Bailout. You've heard the editorial board. People, get ready. This is the latest from Michael Girardi. Dude, what's the album going to be called? Let us know, because you're going to have one by the time this damn pandemic ends. This is called Tax Increment Financing. Coming up after this song, Rob Martwick. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show. We're live from Ben's attic. Don't go anywhere.
correct? Let's begin with phase one. Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That's the latest from Michael Girardi. Tax increment financing. We are the ones who fall in line. Yes, indeed, we are. That, But we're intelligent, right, marketers? Yes, we're very intelligent <laughs> as we fall in line. That's awesome. Michael, I'm sure he's uh, he'll be on the live stream chat. Uh, if you want access to that song, uh, I'm sure he'll email yeah, I gotta it to get you. The, yeah, and the lyrics. We need the lyrics. Uh, I gotta write a whole. I could write a whole column about that good, song. Yeah, he uh, he he sent the lyrics over with the email as okay, well. I'll right, forward cool. that to you. Right. But uh, yeah, that's the latest from Michael Girardi. Man, we, keep them coming, man. We are the ones who fall in line. Yes, we are. All right. That's what we do in Chicago, D. We fall in line. I know. I'm learning that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Here. All right. Let's call up Rob Martwick. My favorite part of the show. Yes. Calling a guest. I really yes. miss this. Oh, of course, we'll probably be doing this at the studio as well, D. So. Oh, and in perfect time, there's the air conditioner kicking uh, on. <laughs> All right. Now, here we go. Okay. Now, we're going to reach out to him. If something seems to go awry, Ben, don't say uh-oh. All right? Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, she said not to say it. And impulsively, I felt the urge to say it. All right. Here we go. This is my favorite part of the show. It's ringing. Hello. Rob? Hello. Yeah. All right. Rob Martwick on the phone. D, it worked, man. Yeah. Rob, just call us high tech, man. We we make it work. You sound clear as a bell, right? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So last week, uh, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I was part of a, uh, a virtual town hall meeting that Senator Martwick sponsored. Uh, so now we're returning the favor. I said as part of that deal, cut a deal, Chicago style. Mark, wait, come on my show. He said, all right. So here you are, Rob. Safe and sound, I assume? Safe and sound. Uh, sitting in my home office here, in the, uh, literally in my home, um, looking out at my backyard on this beautiful day and, uh, you know, hoping to keep getting through all this stuff. All right. Well, I have a whole list of things I want to talk to you about. Uh, I'll just run them down in general, the casino, budget, uh, your thoughts on Darren Bailey, uh, who looks like he's getting ready to run for governor, uh, and uh, vote by mail. A lot to talk about that. But let's start with uh, the, your downstate drive. Uh, I've already teased this a little bit. Uh, you hopped in your car and you drove Ooh. to Springfield for the special sec session that took place last week. Talk about uh, what was on your mind when you took that drive. Well, you know, it's... It, it, so the Illinois Department of Public Health issued guidelines that said if you have underlying health conditions, and, and it was the only one that they're emphatic about, all caps in the in their little guidance, do not go to Springfield, right? Well, I, I've got this. I've got heart disease, diabetes, and, and high blood pressure. It's, uh, you know, I, I maintain my health really well, but I've got these conditions. And so I took their advice, and I did not go to session. But on the very last day, 
I got a call that said that the Chicago casino might fail, that they had 29 votes and they needed a 30th vote. And without it, my vote, it might not pass. And, and uh, it was difficult. I got to tell you, I was terrified on the way down there. But I got I got a suit on. I shaved my beard off, my pandemic beard. And uh, I, I got in the car and I, I started south to Springfield. Um, it, it was a good experience. I, I was able to distance from people and I was there and, and cast a vote. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, it, it was a tough one, but it was something that, like it, sometimes you, you got to do what you got to do. And in this instance, the city of Chicago, especially, I mean, we were, when, when we were, when the world was just clicking along and Chicago was doing great, we were in big financial trouble with our pensions. And given what this pandemic has done, we, we had to have that revenue. We had to. It, it secures our pensions. Uh, all that revenue from the casino goes into our police and fire pensions, which secures our city finances. It prevents huge property tax increases for our homeowners. We had to do it. And so I drove down there. Now, in the end, it wound up getting 42 votes not the 30 that it needed for passage, quite a bit more, 12 more than necessary. And so, you know, I suppose there's a chance that my vote wasn't needed, but those are the sorts of things that you never know. Um, you know, in my eight years in the General Assembly, I've learned that on those really controversial votes, that there are a group of people who really don't know what they want to do. They, they don't want to vote for a bill, but they don't want to be against the bill. And, um, so if it's going to go down, they'll vote no. But the moment it, it looks like it's going to pass, the second it looks like it's going to pass, they all jump on to be recorded as a yes because they didn't want to be on the record against it. So um, yeah, this is, and, uh, and I think that's a possibility. This uh, uh, let's take a moment to talk about this, and we'll come back to the casino. We, before we came on the show, yeah. Rob and I were uh, reminiscing about great votes. Uh, in the past, and you mentioned marriage equality, and this it's the psychology of a legislator who's in sort of a predicament. He or she uh, wants to vote a certain way, but is worried if he or she is the deciding vote. Because when you're the deciding right. vote, then it's like they could put a picture of you on a, a flyer and say, if it wasn't for Representative Jones, this thing wouldn't have passed. And you know what I mean? They could really scare you. But if yep. you're not the deciding vote, if Martwick, in this case, is the deciding vote for casinos, then you're free to join the crowd. And you can say, hey, it was going to pass anyway. Uh, right. it, you know, it. The games people play, Rob. I mean, <laughs> do you understand? It's yeah, no, it, and it happens, right? So, like in, in the marriage, you brought up the marriage equality bill. Um, there were two Republicans that voted yes on the marriage equality bill um, for very personal reasons. Um, <clears throat> they had members of their family that were were gay, and they were just like, "No, I'm voting for this." When the entire Republican caucus was against it, but the curious third Republican was Tom Cross who was the leader of the Republicans at that time. So all of the Republican caucuses against it, say, for two, the leader typically goes with his caucus or he gets his caucus to follow him. But in this instance, Tom Cross kind of sat there, and he was a no until the very last second. The moment that bill crossed 60 votes in the House of Representatives, Tom Cross, boom, at the last second, made his light green. And, of course, the backstory is, or the understory is, is that he was about to run for state treasurer. Well, if you're going to run statewide in, in, in a blue state like Illinois, you can't be that conservative in your vote on, a, on an issue that was as popular as marriage equality. So at the last second, he jumped on for his statewide bid. And, and so that happens a lot, especially a casino bill like this. There might be people who will who would rather see the bill fail, but if it's going to pass, well, let me get in, let me get in line for the gravy train for whatever might come out of this, right? Either for my district or for future favors from people who really wanted this bill. So, so yeah, but I mean, look, I'm glad it passed because Chicago really, really desperately needed it. it it's, we have to have that revenue. 
All right, let me just take a moment here, and this is me speaking, not Rob Martwick, to talk about how kind of worthless the Republican Party is uh, in the face of really significant issues like well, the advancement of gay rights. All right, let's just pause for a moment. Let's just not let this moment pass, Rob Martwick. And this is me speaking. You're not, I'm not saying he's going to sign on to what I'm about to say because Rob's got to get along with Republicans down in Springfield. But what a bunch of cowards. No heavy lifting whatsoever on marriage equality. None so ever. Not having the guts to go tell your constituents, you know, you know this is a bogus issue, ladies and gentlemen. You know you don't care if uh, two men get married. What do you care? You, it doesn't affect your life one way or the other. So just shut up and go along. No guts, no nothing. But when, when the leader of the Republicans, who didn't make a move, didn't lift a finger to get it passed, when he sees it's going to pass and he wants to run statewide, then he pushes the green button. And only in a state, and this is me speaking, not Robert, only in a state where voters are so dumb that they fall for this year, <laughs> would that work? You get what I'm saying, Rob? This is, if Tom Cross wants to run yeah. statewide and, and wants to show gay people in, this, in, in the city of Chicago or Cook County or DuPage County or liberal voters – that he has guts and courage, he should have taken a stand on this bill. Yeah, and, well, and and and, and uh, rant taken and uh, all of it appropriate. The only thing I would say is that 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 last second vote is uh, 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 does not know party line. So there are plenty of, of Democrats who have sat there with their finger on the button waiting to see how something goes before they vote on very controversial issues. And you just pick a pension reform, right? And that's why we never know these things until the last second. And the other end of it, the other aspect of it, to be honest, especially, um, you know, on the Democratic side, it is a lot of people. And, um, you know, there's an argument between <laughs> that these are the really the skilled legislators. Is they won't vote yes until they get something out of it, right? Yeah. And whether it's a project for their district or a job for a constituent, they're constantly holding the process hostage in order to extract something from the process. Maybe that's, maybe that's a skilled legislator. I don't know, but uh, it happens on both sides of the aisle. Oh, it does. By the way, uh, on that line, my uh, old friend, Alderman Rick Munoz, long gone in the Chicago City Council, used to tell me, Ben, I, I, you watch. I'm going to trade this vote with Daly for something. For my... <laughs> He's always swapping votes. He was like, Ben, you got to understand. Yeah. I'm going to vote. You're not going to like how I want to vote, but I'm going to cut a deal. So, yeah, there is that mentality. <laughs> and by the way, we'll get into it when we get vote by mail. The Democrats, you're absolutely correct. It's, it's uh, not just uh, Republicans who play this game, but I'm just saying on a bill of such significance, symbolic significance, which gets like, like marriage equality, which gets us a fundamental right. And Republicans are the party that always talk about liberty and how they stand up for what they believe, let the chips fall where they may, freedom ain't fit free, and all that other stuff that we've been hearing so much about. It sure does look cowardice that you wouldn't take the straw. That's all it, I'm saying. That's You get what I mean? It, it, uh, and, and Yeah, absolutely. And when you start talking about vote, for, vote by mail, uh, it wasn't. It, it was more than cowardice. It was complete and total self-interest, right? Um Let's be honest, vote by mail is going to have effects both ways. And again, in a state that is mostly blue, then in, then it, it, you would expect then that the benefit would be to the party that has more voters. Hence, the Democrats are going to come out ahead. But in certain areas of the state where it's overwhelmingly Republican, they would come out. So what you saw is you saw a lot of Republicans take to the, the debate about this, and they were like, well, no, we're all for access to voting. But, you know, they fall back on that, but we've got to protect the sanctity of the process. In other words, if it's more Republicans coming out, we're all for it. But we think there's more Democrats coming out, so we're worried about people stealing votes. All right. We, we'll it's get to vote by mail. And by the way, did any, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen a, the roll call. Uh, did, did any Republicans vote for the vote for mail in the Senate? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to, I'll look it up while okay. we're talking. All right. Well, don't know that I'll, I'll look it up later. Get into that one. Uh, let's go back to the pensions. 
Uh, so, yes, the final vote was 42 to 14 in the Senate. So they didn't need your 30th vote. But the fact that you were there as a 30th probably freed up 12 people to go, oh, well, now that Mark Rick's risking life and limb to come to uh, Springfield with his uh, various conditions, uh, all right, we'll vote for it. So, uh, so yeah, I guess you're, you really represented 12 votes, 12 extra votes, Rob, uh, if you play that game. All right, so here's the question I have. And I think I've already posed this question to you. Part of the reason why the bill had, the bill was already, there was already was a casino bill that passed, I'm losing track of time, Rob. Was it last June, I want to say, of 2019? Is, is, am I right about that? About a year ago? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mayor yeah. Lightfoot, your old friend, just said that, well, we have to go back and change it because the formula uh, wasn't, favorable enough to entice uh casino operators i had my issues with that you know like you can't i mean the whole system is set up to soak the saps who you know go there i don't know how why they need any more money but whatever that's how it went down so was there a sense of what had to be done to make the the casino in chicago more attractive to a casino operator yeah, I mean, so there was a study done that the city of Chicago commissioned, and the study said that, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on casinos or on gaming, but the, 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 the study that was done, and the mayor really, really strongly believed that the casino would not be viable under the, the tax structure that we created. And so what it did was, she she immediately came down and said, "Look, we've we've got to adjust the tax rates according to the study so that we will get qualified bidders to come in and bid for this casino so we can get the ball rolling on it. Without it, they just no one was interested in coming in and bidding. And they did say, would anybody like to bid?' And they were not getting bid. So, you know, again, are we giving them a break? Would they have done it? You know, there's some speculation that." And, and there are, again, there are people who, who on, on both sides of the aisle, who probably said, eh, you know, maybe you'd get a bid, maybe you wouldn't, who knows. Um, not everyone was convinced, but the mayor was definitely convinced. And so she wanted to adjust that. And that's what this did. Um, it adjusted the tax structure to make uh, it more viable so you get more bidders and you can get the, the ball rolling on it. Well, it's uh, so it is. It's a tax reduction on the amount of taxes that the casino operator is going to have to pay. All right. So the casino operator pays less in taxes. So there's less money that we get. Uh, uh, we, the, either the state of Illinois or the city of Chicago, get, uh, but we will get enough to uh, help pay for the pensions. So I guess it, the way I look at it, it's a a, a necessary vice, uh, Rob. Uh, it, to- it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and Ben, this is something that, you know, like I said, people, and I get it, pensions are boring. People don't really want to understand the details of it, but the Chicago pension systems are, you know, when people say Illinois has the worst pension systems in the country, that's not true. Chicago has the worst pension systems in the country. Illinois, the state pension systems are twice as financially viable as the cities. The cities are on the brink of collapse, and in the midst of this downturn, if we didn't do something, like I said, the ripple effects, pension systems go bankrupt, there's municipal bankruptcy, which means the city can't borrow money, which means big financial crisis, which means taxes go through the roof, which, you know, middle-class homeowners already can't afford the property taxes that we're paying. We need to, we, we need to stop this. And the ripple effects would, what a lot of people don't understand, would ripple across the whole state. The suburbs would, would feel the effects. Heck, downstate would feel the effects because, you know, the city puts way more into the pot than it takes out in terms of taxes, right, to the state. We put in money, and downstate gets roads built. So everyone would suffer if Chicago didn't secure its finances. And so that's why I felt like this was something that just had to get passed. Yeah, no, I, I would have voted for it, too, uh, for all my yapping here. <laughs> and It's in, in my little uh, attic studio overlooking uh, the brown line in the alley in a porta potty, Rob. Uh, Martwick, I would have voted for it too. So you know, I uh, I would have been belly aching and complaining, but I would have voted for it if yeah. 
if, 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 if as impossible as it sounds, if I was ever elected to anything. All right. Now, the, the, the one I'm not sure about is the vote by mail. Lead us through this one. Uh, this was we had a, an indivisible representative on the show uh, last week urging uh, the, the state to, to pass a vote by mail bill that would automatically send ballots to every voter uh, in the state, every registered voter in the state of Illinois. The, uh, the measure that was passed uh, would send applications as opposed to ballots so people could fill out a, uh, a vote by mail application. Talk a little bit about what went down uh, to get applications and not ballots in the bill. Well, like anything else, it's a compromise, you know, um, no doubt about it. I was for ballot. Send a ballot. And that way, look, you don't want to vote, don't send it back. Right? It's that simple, right? Uh, But why complicate through these multiple steps of the process if you're going to truly do this? And, and, uh, but, but the compromise was, and again, you know, I live in the city of Chicago. Um, There are Democrats that are elected in areas where it's not as Democrat as the city of Chicago. It's not as liberal, as progressive as the city of Chicago. And there are Democrats that are in areas where Donald Trump wins. So, um, you know, they didn't feel comfortable with that level of a vote by mail. So the compromise was, uh, was that we mail out an application to every person who voted in the 2018 general election or the 2019 consolidated election or the 2020 primary election. They would receive an application. Anyone else, if you're a registered voter but you're not one of those three, you haven't voted since 16, you can still apply for a ballot. You can still go and vote in person. Um, You can still take advantage of early voting. But this just says now that instead of you having to be to proactively ask for an application for vote by mail, we're going to send you one. If you're one of the, if you voted in any of the last three elections, we're going to send you that that uh, application, and and then so we're also going to. There, there is a provision in the bill which is good, is that we are going to proactively encourage people to vote by mail. So the Secretary of State is going to include notice of the vote by mail and registration uh, in the constitutional amendment brochure that's being mailed out for the, for the fair tax. So he's going to tell everybody, make sure you vote by mail. And then they're going to send a second notice to anyone who received the application and didn't submit it. So if we mail it out to you and you didn't send it back to us. We're going to send you a reminder. Notice. And so um, I think that's going to help a lot. Clearly more and more people were taking advantage of vote by mail in this last primary, way more people took advantage of it. But even then, that was on the tip of this pandemic. Come November, when we could very well be in the midst of a, a second wave, um, a second peak, I think it's going to be it's going to be big. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad that we passed it. All right. Now, this is uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the strategies that Republicans, uh, the games Republicans play when it comes to uh, matters like uh, marriage equality. This is the old maestro, Michael Madigan, and uh, I've been I've been I've been feeling like a bizarre affection for Michael Madigan these days, Rob Martwick. I just wrote this in a column. Uh, and it's because I'm. It's the, the, I spent the '90s fighting the machine and the O's. Okay, you know what I'm saying. So Madigan was usually on the other side of local yeah. issues for me. But I look at this like existential threat we're facing now with Donald Trump and the Republicans who are lunatics. And I realize that a certain amount of discipline and street smarts uh, is necessary for Democrats. So I'm feeling kind of like a, a bizarre uh, affinity for Michael Madigan, which um, I'm getting mocked by many of my lefty listeners for. But whatever, that's the, the reality. So he's protecting his constituents on this. I mean, I mean, his caucus members. That's I what mean, he's doing. Yeah, the guy is a constant, consummate battlefield general, you know. He knows how to maximize his victories and minimize his losses. And um, as you said, you know, we've had this, this great realignment, right? Um, there are fewer and fewer rural Democrats and fewer and fewer suburban Republicans, right? 
I mean, it's just the, the closer you get to urban, the more likely it is to be a Democrat-controlled area. And so we get this great divide. There is less of that. You know, you think about back in the in the uh, the old days when they had the three-member districts and you had elected Democrats and Republicans from all over the state. There was less of this divide, and and when it when the lines are so clear, when the battle lines are so clear, that's when a guy like Madigan becomes so much more important because it's really the more there are two distinct sides to the fight, the more that are that the, the wins are, you know, they're, they're absolute. It's wins or losses. You win or lose. There's no, hey, we did okay, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where Madigan becomes very, very important is that in those important fights, he knows how to get the most out of it and, and get the most important victory. Well, and, and so let's go back to the vote by mail. So, um if a, a Democrat who is in a rural district or in a district which uh, went heavily, went strong for Donald Trump, even for Trump or like in the high 40s for Trump, uh, he or she is vulnerable to accusations that the Republicans are promoting that there's something fraudulent about vote by mail. This, this is the chorus right. that the Republicans are singing. Uh, they get their lyrics written up by the White House and Donald Trump and they just follow along. And so that's why that uh, the Democrats that a Democrat running in such a district district needs a little protection, if you will, from this type of accusation. Absolutely, this is yeah to protect against all the illegal aliens who are trying to subvert our elections. Like what? Come on! It's, and and you know it's 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 silly, but again, uh, if we've learned anything in the Donald Trump era, is that facts matter not to these people. Yeah. It's, you know, whatever comes out of the mouth of the, the great orange one is, is taken as, as truth. And, and uh, um, you know, there, there are almost, I mean, it's a, in a country as big as ours and, and with elections going on as often as they are, there are so few cases of, of actual vote fraud as to be infinitesimally small. And yet, you know, that, that they go back to this all the time. This, the, the arguments were fascinating. They were talking about, um, you know, like establishing in jurisdictions a, a drop box where people can go and, you know, drop the the, uh, the ballot in. And, oh, my God, they went into this huge debate. And it's like, oh, my God, how do we know that these drop boxes will be secure? And it's like, well, well, what are what are the, the details of the drop box? Well, well, we're leaving that up to the locals to sort of figure out. Oh my God! How, and this is the thing that always talks about: we have to have local control. The Republicans write about local control, and then all of a sudden, local control letting them figure it out was terrible. And it, it, was, it was amazing the histrionics they went through. You know, my favorite part was when they were talking about these boxes, and they're like, "Well, what's it going to be like?" And I, I can't even remember who said it, but someone was like, "You, you know, like a, a post office box." You know. Like, Oh, they're spread throughout and they're not often vandalized, even though they might have envelopes containing money or checks in them. You know what I mean? It's like, but they're, they're so concerned about suddenly these ballot boxes were going to be vandalized, you know? And, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty silly. It was pretty silly. Their arguments were very thin. That party line vote, you asked me, I looked it up. 37 yeses in the House, 19 noes. That's straight party line. Wow. In, in, in the Senate, you mean? Yep, in the Senate. Right, in the Senate. Yeah, I imagine the House was the same. I didn't, I didn't look it up. I yeah. it well, now and let's just and let's just pause to talk about this for a moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, vote by mail is a tactic that the Republicans will be using. So they'll be talking out of two sides of your mouth. Look, I just urge my Democratic listeners not to be dumb and and not to fall for Republican. Tra- it's not like an honest debate that's going on. It's not like Republicans are sincerely interested, Rob, in trying to figure out a, a, a smart system to have elections. They're looking for an advantage. And they really are in trouble because if you just do it by straight up voting, they lose. There are more people voting Democrat yeah. in this country than vote Republican. So the Republicans have to figure out a way uh, to fix the system so that they can turn their minority status into a ruling status. I mean, that's just what's going on, and, right? And Ben, you've seen it everywhere in the country where the Republicans have control um, of the states, and, and every red state where it's a, a Republican-controlled General Assembly and, and a governor's office, they have gone in the opposite direction. 
They've done things to kick people off the rolls, to make it harder for people to vote, to tighten. You know, if you don't show up with an ID, you can't vote. And it's like, but I'm a registered voter and I'm a citizen. I voted my whole life. Nope, you don't have your ID. We can't trust that it's actually you. So that's, that's exactly right. Everywhere they've gone, and, and Governor Pritzker pointed that out, it's like everywhere they're in control, they're trying to limit people's rights to vote because they know that the more people vote, the worse chance they have. Unless, unless they can work it to their advantage. I'm just going to remind people, all these Republicans who voted for vote by mail in the state of Illinois, they lined up, all of them, uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't say anything about what went down in the 25th Congressional District in California. And Rob, I, I'll just tell you this, only a geek like I would know this stuff, but in that district, there was a special election and the Republican was victorious, Mike Garcia, largely because, get this, vote by mail. And I, you know what? I give the Republicans credit. They outfoxed the Democrats. The Democrats fell asleep in California. They got lazy and they were defeated at vote by mail by the Republicans. I didn't hear any Republicans in Illinois citing that. By any chance. Did anybody talk about the 25th Congressional District during the debate last week in Springfield? Uh, I didn't hear it, <laughs> no, not, not from the Republican side. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because the Republicans have engaged in Illinois in uh, vote by, you know, as, as a campaign strategy, right? I mean, it, it is a campaign strategy in these type districts to encourage your base to go out and vote by mail, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you can, they, they are literally mailing applications from a political process, not from a governmental process, that's okay. So a, a campaign can mail out a bunch of applications to their voters and say, and you can say, I'm not mailing them to everybody because it's a campaign tactic. You can say, I'm just gonna mail them out to the Republicans and say, hey, fill them out and then I'll follow up with you. Did you get that? You fill it out, get your vote in early, because you know they're going to be your vote. There was a lot of complaining in 2018 because Governor Rauner in 2014 had spent a lot of money on vote-by-mail programs to help the Republican Party. In 2018, he promised to. And then when his campaign went off the rails and it looked like he was, he, where everybody knew he was going to lose. Remember, there was the rumor that in the summer he was trying to get off the ballot and let somebody else replace him. Yeah. Well, he, and not to, this is the wrong analogy here, but his campaign mailed it in, so to speak, in terms of the rest of his campaign, but they didn't follow through on all of that spending on vote by mail uh, programs that they said that they were going to and that's what put a lot of these local republican races in in trouble and, and you know uh, again i don't know the extent to which you could say that he was responsible for the wins of a lauren underwood or a sean caston but i think there are people in the republican party that would argue that his failure to deliver on those programs cost them votes. Mm. Well, so not, they've done it they've yeah. engaged in it no they, like i said it's uh it's a tactic that the Republicans use to their advantage in, in, in several districts, and they will continue to use their advantage. They'll do it two ways. They'll say, when we do it, it's right. That's what Trump says. Yeah. Literally, Donald Trump says, when I vote for mail in Florida, it's fair, and it's because I don't live there, and it's convenient, and it's it's law-abiding. But whenever any Democrat does it, it's illegal. Uh, so they're talking out of two sides of the mouth. All right, now uh, let's close it down with the discussion of the new face. I call him the face of the Republican Party in the state of Illinois, and that would be Darren Bailey, your old colleague, your old House colleague before uh, Rob was a state senator. He was a member of the House. Uh, and uh, Darren Bailey from downstate Clay County was in Chicago yesterday. I don't know if you know this, uh, Rob, for a, uh, a, a rally against J.B. Pritzker. People were waving signs that said... Yep. F-U-J-B. We're very friendly here in the city of Chicago. We welcome all types to come to the city and exercise their First Amendment protected rights. I always point, I always point it out. I'm wondering if, uh, if I held a rally in Clay County, would they be so tolerant of me uh, if, if I had a sign that said F-U uh, Donald Trump? But uh, Darren Bailey said, uh, said that, uh, you know, he kind of let the, 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 the notion out there that he's thinking of running for governor. Uh, what's your sense of what uh, Darren Bailey and represents in terms of Illinois politics? Well, first of all, what I what I would like to say is I hope to God he runs for governor. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, so that's number one. Let me get that out of the way. Um, number two, uh, 
you know, I, Darren Bailey is, uh, 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 I'm not going to try and be nice here. He is everything that's wrong with politics in this country. He is the politics of division when it benefits him. And you think of the hypocrisy of this guy. And, and look, I, I have a personal disdain for him because he not only refused to wear a mask, which is like, what does it bother you to wear a mask? But he's going to make a political statement about not wearing a mask. But on top of that, they asked all the legislators to get tested. He didn't get tested. So he tested, he doesn't wear a mask. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's willing to make a political statement and put people's lives at risk. And that, that should be uh, all you need to know about a person right there. But on top of all of this, this is the guy who is part of this Eastern Bloc of these Southeastern legislators that their big call is to kick Chicago out of the rest of the state of Illinois, draw a line at I-80 and everything north is its own state and everything south. And now, he, but suddenly he loves Chicago, right? All he does is rail about Chicago when he was down in Clay County and tell everybody how awful the, the, they call it the state of Chicago, how awful the state of people. And they're just, they're penalizing, they're, they're, they're hurting everyone downstate and imposing their, horrible will upon us. But then suddenly he comes to Chicago and now, well, now he loves Chicago and he wants to run for governor. The good news, Ben, is that when he was at his massive rally of about 35 people, um, you know, like if you look at the picture, I think there's more police officers making sure nothing goes wrong than there were actual people listening to Darren Bailey. So it gives you an idea. Look, he's about to come to the Senate. So I served a year with him in the House of Representatives and I got appointed to the Senate now he's going to run for the Senate he's going to win and it's a shame because he's replacing a true statesman Dale Ryder has been in the Senate for a long time and he represents that area so well and don't get me wrong he's conservative there's very little that he and I would ever agree on policy wise but you have to take him seriously because he's educated he is thoughtful um, he brings his A game to the debate, and he's going to make you prove the old point, make sure that you're, what you're doing is the right thing, um, and, and make sure that you can back it up. Darren Bailey, is, he, he's a sideshow, and, and that's too bad for the people of his district, because regardless of what they believe, they ought to have somebody representing them. And I, don't, I don't think he represents anybody but himself. Well, uh, here, here's his uh, – I'll just trot this out. This is his appeal to Chicago. Uh, here's a quote from the rally. I love Chicago. It's part of Illinois. I'm just reading this quote. So uh, at, at least it is at, because the Eastern Bloc hasn't got its way. But anyway, I love Chicago. It's part of Illinois. But sometimes when you raise a wayward child, you have to discipline that child. And that'll win over a lot of votes in the city of Chicago. We're wayward yeah. children uh, in the city of Chicago. Um, so. Yeah, I heard that. Again, I, I can imagine it. Uh, Somebody from Beverly thinking that you know, a Darren Bailey ought to, it needs to discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Rob Markwick, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, stay safe, stay sound. We're talking about Thanks, uh, moving out of the attic in a couple of weeks back to the studio. So um, we'll see. We'll see if uh, we emerge uh, from our, our hiding. If things are a little safer and we can get back to the routine. I'm looking forward to it. Me too, Ben. Can't wait to see you again. And until then, uh, be safe, uh, you and your family. And thanks for having me on the show, though. That's State Senator Rob Markwick. Thanks so much, Rob. And uh, I want to thank him for coming on the show. Uh, and I guess it was sort of the Darren Bailey show. Any updates, D? Uh, no, not really. No uh, updates. Any updates, no. Uh, and I want to thank Mike Girardi. Great song, that tax increment findings. So I'm going to get yeah, it. Yeah, we'll end it with... Uh... That song today. Uh, and I'll probably uh, write. A, I'll probably write a story about it in the reader. D. I'm so motivated, fired up by just hearing it the first. The lyrics no really way. capture uh, the insanity of that song. So I want to thank Rob Markwick. I want to thank Mike Girardi. And of course, I want to thank the man, the myth, the legend, the pride and joy of Alton, Illinois. And as Rob Markwick can tell you, back home in Alton, they call him White Lightning. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody.
Let's begin with phase one. That's correct. 